Hello and welcome. It's 10 a.m. on Friday the 8th of August. You're tuned in to our mid-morning newscast here on Arirang TV. I'm Mark Broom. Let's take a look at what's making the headlines. President Park Geun-hye calls on South Korea to help North Korea build up its infrastructure and improve its people's lives as the first step towards reunifying the two Koreas. Sources say officials from the White House will hold another meeting next month with two elderly Korean victims of Japan's wartime sex slavery as pressure grows on Tokyo to atone for its past wrongdoings. Plus, U.S. military officials say a mission to drop humanitarian relief to thousands of refugees who have, driven out, uh, of, have been driven out of their town by Islamist uh, militants is underway in northern Iraq. Our top story this morning, President Park Geun-hye is calling on officials and experts from a cross-section of South Korean society to do more to reduce inter-Korean tensions and boost humanitarian aid to the north. She was speaking to the Presidential uh, Reunification Committee on Thursday, which had come together for the first time since its formation last month. Our Jimmy Gill starts us off. The Park Geun-hye administration has placed a priority on economic reform in recent weeks, but has also shifted its focus back toward a unification drive with North Korea, an initiative that was overshadowed by April's very tragedy and the escalation of provocations out of North Korea. President Park on Thursday ordered members of a newly established 50-member special committee to draw up measures for building up infrastructure in North Korea and improving the lives of the North Korean people as a first step. The committee plans to conduct joint government and civilian research for unification and arouse greater public interest in the matter. President Park has said that a reunification of the two Koreas will be an economic bonanza for the peninsula and neighboring countries. During a speech in Dresden, Germany in March, she called for bolstering cross-border exchanges as a first step toward building trust between the rival Koreas and laying the groundwork for unification. The two Koreas have been divided for more than six decades following the 1950 to 1953 Korean War, which ended in a ceasefire, not a peace treaty. Kim Young-gil, Arirang News. Now, pro-North Korea daily in Japan says Pyongyang's recent missile launches are meant in protest of the U.S. military's presence here in South Korea, and particularly in light of this month's joint military drills between Seoul and Washington. Comparing Pyongyang's test launches to a shield and the U.S.-South Korea exercises to a spear, the article says the North Korean regime is prepared to fire off its ballistic missiles in defense if necessary. North Korea has test-fired short-range ballistic missiles on seven different occasions so far this year. A Korean-American who runs a Christian NGO in a Chinese city on the border with North Korea is being investigated by Chinese authorities. According to sources on Thursday, Peter Han has been under interrogation by Chinese authorities for the last three weeks and is banned from leaving the country. People working in the region presume that Han's case is part of a wider sweep of Christian-run NGOs and businesses along the Chinese side of the border with North Korea. The sources say they don't exactly know what prompted the probe, but it does coincide with an investigation into a Canadian Christian couple who ran a coffee shop in the nearby city of Dandong. They are being questioned over suspicions they stole military and intelligence secrets. 
Now, two Korean survivors of Japan's brutal wartime sexual slavery system are in the U.S. right now. They are there to raise awareness of the highly emotive issue and hopefully squeeze a much overdue apology out of the Japanese government. Last week, the women held a meeting rather, with the officials from the White House and word out of Washington is that there will be another meeting next month. Our Park ji -won reports. Quoting diplomatic sources in Washington, Seoul-based Yeonam News and YTN report that the White House will soon hold another round of meetings with two Korean victims of Japan's wartime sexual enslavement. Lee Yok sun and Kang Il-chul, both in their 80s, held closed-door talks with White House officials at the end of last month during a 15-day trip to the U.S., which came to an end on Wednesday. The upcoming meetings will reportedly be attended by the White House officials in charge of foreign affairs policies. It's expected they could place pressure on the U.S. State Department to be more proactive in solving the long-standing issue. International calls on Japan to make amends for forcing women into sexual slavery before and during World War II has picked up in recent weeks. UN High Commissioner for Human Rights Nabi Pili criticized Tokyo on Wednesday for failing to resolve the issue. In response to Pili's criticism, Japanese Chief Cabinet Secretary Yoshihide Suga said the issue was covered in a 1965 treaty between Korea and Japan when Korea received some $800 million in aid and loans as part of the settlement. PLA, whose term ends this month, emphasized that the women continue to suffer decades later due to the senseless remarks of Japanese officials who continue to deny the atrocities were ever carried out, with some even referring to them as prostitutes. Park ji -won, Arirang News. Now, the World Health Organization is holding an emergency meeting for a second straight day to analyze whether the current Ebola outbreak in West Africa constitutes what they call a public health emergency of international concern. Now, if the WHO considers the current situation as sufficiently worrisome, then the emergency committee will recommend to the director general of the WHO to issue an alert. The UN Health Agency will recommend appropriate temporary measures to reduce uh, the international spread of the virus. The U.S. Center for Disease Control has maintained its highest alert level since Wednesday, which is reserved for the most serious public health emergencies. The latest figures from the WHO say this Ebola outbreak has killed 932 people from slightly over 1,700 sus suspected and confirmed cases, mostly in Liberia, Sierra Leone and Guinea. Said that a team of South Korea... Get connected to Korea and the world. Join us every weekday for the latest developments out of Korea, Asia and beyond. On air, on your mobile and online, we lead the way every day at Young News. To try and resolve the crisis in Ukraine, the European Union also offers 15 billion euros. Now, the uh, latest military bullying scandal where a 23-year-old conscript was found to have died after being bullied for months is still reverberating throughout Korea as more gruesome details emerge about the young man's suffering. The head of Korea's military human rights center says the victim, only identified by his family name Yoon, was clinically dead by the time he was transported to a nearby hospital. The center chief also claimed that the army private was killed primarily as the result of a severe beating by his fellow soldiers. And he again urged that his attackers be charged with murder. We found that when the victim was sent to the hospital, one of his attackers said, if we are asked about the bruises on his chest, let's say he got them while receiving CPR. This is a serious situation. Now, Yoon was apparently frequently bullied by his fellow servicemen. He was allegedly forced to hold a horse riding stance, a kind of stress position until the early hours of the morning, and was also told to lick phlegm off the ground. In another bullying incident in recent months, an army sergeant who had uh, allegedly been bullied by his fellow soldiers went on a shooting rampage that killed five. 
Now, the Korean government, in an effort to get the nation's biggest firm spending more and hopefully driving Korea's economic growth, this week introduced a corporate tax revision. The proposal, which would tax excessive cash reserves, has gone down like a, a lead balloon, really, in some circles, though, with critics saying it unfairly favours the nation's largest businesses. Korea's finance minister uh, looked to deflect some of those criticisms on Thursday, stressing the measures will ultimately spur economic growth here in Korea. Our Kim Jeon reports. Finance Minister Choi kyung hwan defended the government's tax revision on conglomerates, dismissing criticism that the new changes would benefit only the heads of the country's biggest companies. Choi said the proposal is intended to encourage conglomerates to use their cash reserves in ways that would benefit the economy. He said the plan is to boost domestic demand and create a virtuous cycle in which capital flows into households. As a result of conglomerates making investments, paying out dividends and and raising the wages of their employees. Choi says the main reason for the country's sluggish domestic consumption was because household income slowed to a standstill compared to corporate income. Between 2008 and 2013, disposable income among households increased about 30 percent compared to more than 80 percent among companies. In the bank, the combined cash reserves among companies was around 460 billion U.S. dollars in June, a 44 percent increase from 2010. The finance minister stressed the need to induce structural changes in order to get the Korean economy back on track. The country's gross domestic product increased a mere 0.6 percent in the second quarter of the year from the previous quarter, marking its lowest level in three quarters. Kim Jeon, Arirang News. Now, various roads in central Seoul will be closed next week ahead of the papal visit. Pope Francis is scheduled to be in the capital city of Seoul on August 16th to attend a beatification mass. The Seoul Metropolitan Police Agency says starting from next Monday, access will be restricted to some roads around Gwanghamun Square. A day before the mass, major roads encircling the square will be completely closed off, including a stretch from the central government complex to Sungne Moon Gate. Meanwhile, the Seoul city government plans to temporarily adjust bus routes and subway times to accommodate the extremely high profile ceremony. Now, popular internet text messaging applications KakaoTalk and Line are currently being blocked from usage. In China, the Ministry of Science, ICT and Future Planning in Korea said on Thursday that the Chinese government sent word that it had blocked the Korean messenger programs since the beginning of last month uh, because it said they were being used to circulate terrorist-related information. Now, no evidence has been provided to back up Beijing's claim, but the science ministry here in Seoul says it plans on discussing the matter with the Chinese government in order to lift the block on these uh, apps as soon as possible. Staying with a technology-related story, and we're entering the era of wearable technology, and shipments of these wearable devices are expected to top 19 million this year globally, and it's going to keep jumping by about 80% annually over the next five years. And while there's little doubt that they add a lot of extra convenience to our lives, they're also adding to concerns about privacy. Our Kim Minji reports. The explosive growth of wearable devices has also brought with it privacy concerns. According to a new report by Korea's National Information Society agency, there are mounting fears of misuse or abuse of information as wearable devices are able to collect a variety of personal information regardless of place or time. Front and center is Google Glass, which can record everything in view and share it in an instant. The product's facial recognition app, NameTag, is also raising alarms as the user can get their hands on personal information, including a person's name and their photos on social media, just by taking a photo of them. A U.S. senator has already called on Google to come up with measures so that the application only identifies people who have given the permission to do so. Other countries are also stepping up efforts to protect personal information. The British Data Protection Act prohibits the use of personal information obtained through wearable devices for advertisement or business purposes. Australia also offers detailed guidelines when it comes to privacy invasion through the use of digital devices.
Curry, on the other hand, has a lot of ground to make up. Wearable devices do not fall into the category of network cameras or image information processing devices, so relevant laws do not forbid their use. And to be punished by the current information network law, videos must contain pornography or violate privacy or portrait rights. The Korean agency's report points that there needs to be basic standards that can be applied to wearable devices. The Korea Communications Commission acknowledges there is a cause for concern and plans to review relevant laws and regulations. Kim min -ji, Arirang News. Time now for a look through the other international headlines we're following on this Friday morning. For that, we turn to our Eunice Kim standing by at the News Centre. Good morning to you, Eunice. Good morning, Mark. Now, global alarm is growing about the horrific situation we're hearing about in Iraq as the Islamic State militants there are making extremely violent gains in that country. Indeed, Mark. The UN Security Council now issuing a statement condemning the brutal attacks by the jihadist militants that has triggered a mass exodus of tens of thousands thousands of people fleeing to nearby mountains. The U.S. has begun an emergency airdrop of food and water to those refugees as officials in Washington are considering military action that could include airstrikes. The White House said it was gravely concerned for a potential humanitarian catastrophe. The IS militants have reportedly conquered Karakosh, Iraq's largest Christian town, after sweeping through other villages that are home to religious minorities, including including the Yazidis. They were given the ultimatum to convert to their brand of Islam or face death by the sword. And from the Vatican, Pope Francis also called on world leaders to do much more to address the crisis. IS militants had been making gains against Kurdish forces in northern Iraq for weeks. It also has taken the country's largest dam in Mosul and by extension the country's major water and power resource. Negotiations are heating up in Egypt as the 72-hour ceasefire on the Gaza Strip is set to expire within hours. Israel had offered to extend the temporary humanitarian truce on Thursday, but Palestinian factions rejected that proposal. At a pro-Hamas rally in Gaza City attended by thousands of people, Hamas leaders said they were ready to resume rocket attacks if Israel and Egypt do not honor their demands to lift the blockades into and out of Gaza. 66 Israelis and nearly 1,900 Palestinians were killed in the one-month-long conflict. The UN estimates about 70 percent of the Palestinian death toll were civilians. An intense fighting continues to rage in eastern Ukraine, where pro-Russian separatists are said to have shot down another military plane. Local media said the MiG-29 fighter jet was shot down in the Donetsk region Thursday local time, most likely with the same Buk missile system suspected to have been used in the downing of MH-17 last month. Meanwhile, Moscow has released more details on its full embargo on food imports from nations that had sanctioned it. Prime Minister Dmitry Medvedev said the year-long ban would include fruit, vegetables, meat, fish, milk and dairy imports and apply to Australia, Canada and Norway in addition to the U.S. and EU nations. Hurricane Azel is set to make landfall on Hawaii Thursday evening local time, which would be a first for the American island state in 22 years. Officials say they are ready for the storm as the big island is under a hurricane warning and the rest of the state remains on a tropical storm warning. Another Pacific storm, Hurricane Julio, has also strengthened but is still unclear whether it will hit the islands in the next few days. Meanwhile, a 4.3 earthquake rattled the Big Island early Thursday, but no tsunami warning was issued. And TGI Friday, everyone, as we kick things off with once again the ongoing search for the next head coach of the South Korean national football team because it looks like we'll have to wait once again to find out who'll take over the job. 
Now, after Lee Young Soo, the head of the technical committee, came back from his trip to the Netherlands, he held a press conference on Thursday to update everyone on the talks between him and Bert Van Marvik. And it was revealed that while the Dutch coach was offered roughly $1.5 million plus incentives, the 62-year-old wants a week to think about the offer. Lee Young Soo added that if the offer is declined, he will quickly speak with the other two candidates in mind. Now, staying with football, but over to the women's national team this time as the women's Asian Games team got the good news on Thursday as they found out that Park Geun-hun was given the green light to play in Incheon. Now, the 28-year-old who has previously expressed her desire to play for the national team will get her wish as her new club team, WFC Razianka, gave her the permission to play. In fact, according to the team, part of the contract was that she gets to play in the Asian Games no matter what. Now, this is good news for the national team as Park Geun-hun was one of the top goal scorers in the WK League before moving over to Russia. And now moving over to the major leagues as Ryu and Jin of the LA Dodgers will be squaring off against the LA Angels later today, hoping for his 13th win of the season. Now, the sophomore lefty, who's currently 12 and 5 with an ERA of 3.39, will look to repeat his performance from last season when he threw his first complete game shutout on May 29th of last season. But the Angels, who boast a scary lineup, will remember that as the two teams finish off their four game series. And now moving over to some Thursday night KBO action. The Lotte Giants and the Samsung Lions were rained down, but the SK Wyverns beat the Kia Tigers 6-7-2. And the Nexon Heroes rally back to beat the Tucson Bears 6-5. Meanwhile, let's take a look at the LG Twins take on the NC Dinos. And of course, going to the game here, bottom of the first inning, Na Sung Bum at bat, and he drills this ball to deep right. Gone, and it's 1-0 NC Dinos. Second inning, more from NC. This time, it's Chiso Kun who sends this ball to deep left. See ya, two-run shot gives the NC Dinos Finals the three nothing lead, but the sixth inning with NC up six to one, Sunju in and there it goes to deep left, got a three run shot and it's now six to four. Seventh inning this time it's Ebyong Gyu and this one is got a two run shot and we're tied six to six before LG scores three more times in the eighth inning for a nine to six lead. Now despite a late rally from the NC Dinos in the ninth inning, LG does hang on to win this one nine to eight. And now finishing things off in swimming, Michael Phelps, who came back to swimming after his brief retirement, is currently competing at the U.S. Championships taking place in Irvine, California. And it looks like he isn't as dominating as he was in the past. With the 29-year-old Olympian looking to qualify for the 100-meter U.S. team, he struggles in the halfway turn and finishes second to last in the finals and misses the cut. The most decorated Olympian of all time still has three more events to qualify for as he hopes to come back to his original form real soon. And that's going to wrap it up for me. This has been SJ. Have a great rest of the day and see you guys again for your sports needs. Good morning. It's so bright and shiny outside here in the capital. It's hot, but feels nice to have some sun after all those murky days we had. But the eastern and the southern parts of the peninsula will see uh, some clouds and rain throughout the day. So it should feel a bit cooler for people in the east and south, while the remainder of the nation is forecast to have temperatures soaring to 30s today, as the top temperature here in the capital and Gwangju will rise to 31, and Daegu should be a bit cooler at 28, while Busan tops out at 27. Now for other regions, Regions. It looks like Jeju Island and Daejeon should peak at 28, while Tokdo should see a high of 
24 this afternoon. Now, Typhoon Halong has shifted its track to easterly ward, heading towards to mainland Japan. So for here in Korea, southern parts of the peninsula, eastern coastal regions and Jeju should see heavy showers and high waves and strong gusts, while the rest of Korean peninsula will not have as much of effect as we expected. So the weather this weekend here in Seoul will be just a typical summer day with hot temperatures. Well, that's all for Korea, and here's the international weather for viewers around the world. And that does it for now. We'll be back with our next newscast coming up at noon Korea time. It's in about 90 minutes. Until then, goodbye.